the latter, because I just want to warn you now, and one of the reasons why I haven't got pretty pictures on the, on the, on the screen, is that I really want uh, some ideas. I'm, I'm going to throw out, uh, a little later on, uh, some probably pretty crazy ideas as to what else we might do. And I'd like some response to that, and I'd also like some other ideas that you think might help. Um, I, I will start, and, and perhaps just give a tiny bit of background, as, as, as Kevin pointed out. Um, I, I am an, an Essex farmer's son. Um, when most people hear the from Essex, they look at you with a mix of sort of disdain and pity. Um, actually, it's not a bad thing. Some, some things it is. Um, what he didn't mention, actually, in a way I'm quite glad, is that, um, that I'm also a lawyer by, by training. Um, which is also quite dangerous to say, because a lot of people then immediately leave the room and they get a, a, a lawyer. Um, but just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, you know, I, I started off as a blue chip, you know, with Slaughter and May, which is a big city law firm, and decided that wasn't my scene and I wanted to be a lawyer for wildlife. Um, and so I quit uh, the city and went to work for WWF for many years, um, and, uh, and then for the wildlife trusts and various things in between. And I'm now very old and, and multi-hatted. Um, and one of the things that I was asked to do about a year ago was to join the board of Natural England, same time as, as John, John Barley. We're, we're both sort of new, new boys on the board. Which for me was extremely interesting because I've never worked with a government agency before. And as I'm sure we've all heard, you know, Natural England gets a lot of slagging off from a lot of people. Um, and I wondered, you know, thought about it before before you know, agreeing to do this. But, um, but actually, and I'll come on to it in a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to be there. And, and I think that we've got a relatively new board in, on Natural England. Now, there's no question, there's been a lot of comments about uh, George Osborne, that whether we like it or not, public sector funding is going to decline. Now, we can either sit here and know, um, or we can think of how can we do things a bit differently. And certainly the new board on, on natural English has very much got a, a mandate, and John Holmes, the area manager, is, is here, um, and the way it's, I think he's here, he's there, the head of John, uh, and the way it's sort of organised in natural England um, is that the area managers are going to have, you know, they're going to be like the CEO of the organisation in their region, so there's going to be more of a regional focus. But we very much got a mandate to how can we do things a bit differently um, than perhaps we have in the past. Which is not to rubbish everything that's been done in the past, but how can we do things a, a bit differently? And that's what I would uh, want to talk a bit about, about today. But before I do, there was just sort of two or three things that had come up during the course of the day that I wanted to react to. I mean, one is we're here to talk about birds, and quite right too. But we do just need to remind ourselves, um, and it's all in the State of Nature report that Martin talked about <coughs> earlier, that what is happening to birds is happening to other wildlife as well. I mean, if, and particularly in the farm landscape. Um, you know, if you look at amphibians and reptiles, um, not doing so badly in, in village areas, on, on nature reserves, but in the farm landscapes, uh, amphibians and reptiles are doing just as badly as birds. If you look at moths, if you look at butterflies, if you look at invertebrates, it's the similar levels of decline uh, for, for these other, other groups of, 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 of species, and of course for, for wild plants. It's exactly the same as it is. So it's across the board. The other thing that I think perhaps we should remind ourselves, and Harry mentioned the war, and, and Kevin said, you know, talk about the CAP, and of course the CAP can be painted as the big pariah, but actually this has been going on for quite a long time, even before the CAP. Um, I saw a stat the other day that, that at least struck me, was that by 1984, we had already lost 97% of our meadows. And that was by 1984, when the cap's in its infancy. So actually, these, the, the, this trend of decline has been going uh, uh, on a long time. And the other thing I want to say right up front, and several people have said it, but I completely agree, is that we must not blame farmers for what has happened. Um, my, my dad, who, who, who was a tenant farmer, um, I mean, he, I remember him saying, you know, and I am very old, in the 1960s, you know, it's us farmers, we're the problem. But actually, I think blaming farmers is not fair, and it's also not helpful. 
Um, it, it's not fair because farmers were given the instruction during the war, this country needs food security. You know, we must, we must plow up and, and, and use, get crops on every bit of land that we can, make it productive. You know, that was the mantra. You are serving your country if you do that. And, and they followed. And then, of course, you know, the, then after the war, uh, you know, this, this, this again trend continued. Um, and, uh, and then the CAP came in and we wanted to provide cheap food. And, and, and farmers have followed the system, and you really can't blame farmers for, 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 for what has happened. And in many ways, they've been very successful in providing cheap food. I can argue about how healthy it is and all that, but, but, but they have been. Um, so it goes back um, quite a long time. But what is really depressing to me is, um, and I'll get on to the positive bit in a minute, but what is, you know, let's go, go we get all the bad stuff out of the way. What is really depressing to me is that actually, it would be lovely to see that, that, that decline, you know, leveling off and starting to edge up again, and it's not. It's still going down, and that I do find very depressing. And it's not just happening here, it's actually happening throughout, throughout Europe, and arguably throughout the world. And agriculture is the primary issue if you go to Latin America, uh, if you go to Asia, go to Africa, because you know, it's, it's this drive for, for food. Um, and um, so it is a bit depressing that it, that it is continuing. And, and there was an EU sort of mid-term biodiversity review, they called it, uh, came out the other day. Because, of course, as, as Martin was referring earlier to the Ache uh, targets internationally, there is an EU target to halt the decline in biodiversity by 2020. And this was set in 2010. 2015 is midpoint. They did a midpoint review. And, and that... Uh, has found that, again, throughout the EU, biodiversity is continuing to decline, and biodiversity in the agricultural landscape is declining particularly. So it's happening everywhere, and it's still going on. That is depressing. And the other thing that's been mentioned today that you know, I think is, is equally depressing is the fact that I, despite the million members of the RSPB plus the, how many is it in the world I trust now? 750,000, 800,000 members? Maybe there's a bit of crossover between them and the wild. I mean, there's a huge number of people in this country who really support nature conservation. But we're not winning. And, 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 um, and I think that many of the public don't really get it. You know, they still come, come down to Delhi. It looks beautiful. You, you, you even go to Essex in May. Oh, it's wonderful. It's all yellow. It's beautiful. <laughs> and, and, I mean, one can joke about it, but actually it's a bit of a problem. And, and the other day, I, I, um, I went to, to, to Berlin with Mike Clark, the chief executive of the, of the RSPB, uh, to do a sort of German-Anglo collaboration, particularly talking about biodiversity and farm landscape. What can, what can we do? And it was, it was, it, and it was a very lovely event hosted by uh, the British Embassy in Berlin. Uh, and the British ambassador got up to speak, lovely chap, and sort of, you know, said, "Oh, I'm so glad that you know you're all here, and that the Germans and, uh, and, the, and the British are cooperating to do with wildlife and the environment in our country. We've got a wonderful landscape. We're very proud of our countryside, and we want to keep it that way." And again, I thought, yeah, "Great." <laughs> but it, it just that that message of what is happening to birds and other species just hasn't got through, and um, we've got an awful lot of work to do. So that's the. Um, I'm going to drink it. Um, we've got, you know, that, but, that, but that's the sort of the bad stuff. Now, now, what can we do about it? That's what I really wanted to, to address. Is is what can we do now? Clearly. We have got a green environment. So the first thing we've got to do is make sure that we make the absolute best of every single pound we've got. Um, and there are going to be some changes, as many of you will be aware of, that we've had in the past that the, the, there have been all kinds of, of, of types of agri environment over the last 20 years. But just more recently, um, we've had the higher level scheme, uh, which is aimed principally at SSSIs and priority uh, habitats. Um, and we've had the entry level scheme, um, which uh, the idea was to get a whole lot of farmers signed up to it and get them all thinking about the environment. It's a great idea, um, but the sort of the, 
the, the, the research that Natural England did into this, this, this scheme was that actually it really hadn't had much impact, that the bar was to have been set too low, um, and that it wasn't really delivering much for, for, for biodiversity. And so uh, the decision was made to scrap the entry level scheme and to create what's been called this mid tier scheme. So you, you're going to have, as part of the new countryside stewardship, you're going to have a higher tier scheme, which is effectively the sort of the, the, the latest version of, of, of HLS, of the higher level scheme. Um, and will also be aimed principally at SSS at some point, um, and priority habitats. And then you're going to have the mid tier scheme which is going to be different from entry level in the sense that it's going to be a competitive process. It's going to be responding to local priorities. So, so what is going to be supported in one part of the country is not necessarily the same as what be, might be supported uh, some, somewhere else. Um, and also, it's, and this is something I want to come on to a minute, it encourages group applications. It, it encourages clusters of, of, of farmers to, to bid for the scheme. Uh, now, the application date for mid-tier has only just closed. Um, we haven't even seen on, on the board of Natural England yet um, you know, what, what the applications look like. There's still some work to do to, to, to sort uh, those out. But it is going to be, uh, I think, a better scheme in the sense that it's going to be more targeted. Um, um, at delivering real benefits, and, and, uh, and farm and wildlife is going to be the, the principal tool for the uh, direction for the target for the scheme, but also looking at pollinators and also looking at addressing um, diffuse pollution from, 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 from uh, getting into water. Um, so I think that it will be a better scheme. So that's, that's good, and we've got to make sure that, that as I say, every single pound is well spent. But is that going to be enough? Even if we have higher tier and we spend it really well, and even if we have mid tier and we spend it really well, is that going to stem the loss in biodiversity? Is that going to mean that graph starts to go upwards? I'm not sure it's going to be enough. So, what are we going to do about it? Because I am not going to sit here and do nothing. I may come up with really crazy ideas, they may not work, but you know, I, I play lots of tennis. Number one rule when you're playing tennis is if you're winning, keep doing the same thing. If you're losing, doing something, do something different. So I think that we need to be starting to think of what can we do differently. We know there's not going to be lots of, lots of public funding, so what can we do that does not rely on public funding? That sounds like I've got you know, an answer. I'm about to, a rabbit. I'm about to pull out of the hat, and and I and I and I wish I, and I wish I did have because the, the, the truth is that I don't. But I, I do think that there are a number of ideas that we should start thinking about. And now I'm sort of a specialist at leading with my chin and and, and go, coming up with mad ideas. And people quite rightly say, for God's sake, Simon, yes, yeah, it's an idea. That won't work. Fine. Okay. But I also think it's a good idea that if you do chuck out some ideas, maybe one has some traction and can do so. So what I'd like to do now is just give a few thoughts, and I have to say these are personal thoughts, um, as to the kinds of things that we might want to contemplate uh, doing a bit differently. One is that there are a bunch of farmers who really are doing it right, who are really trying. And I'm not sure we're giving them enough credit. I'm not sure they feel special enough. You know, we help the heroes, people who, who, who've come back from Afghanistan, Iraq, are great. But, you know, we've got some heroes in, 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 our, in our countryside, in, in our farm, amongst our farmers. Is there more we can do to make them feel special? To make them feel they really are green heroes? Um, I don't know, but I think we should. I think we should think about that. Um, you know, that the, the maybe, and uh, it'd be nice to hear from Anne, who, who was, uh, you know, was talking earlier about whether you think there are things that can be done to make the people who are doing it right feel more special, get more credit, be seen by the public as really wow, fantastic, or oh, and perhaps even more important, be seen by other farmers as wow, fantastic. That's what we should be aspiring to. So I think that's something we, we need to think about. I also wonder whether 
and I don't know what the Institute of Iran thinks about this, whether or not we can make them sort of ambassadors who actually not only get credit, but actually have a more sort of positive and encouraged role to go and persuade others to do likewise. But in my experience, in farmers, they tend, you know, they don't listen to many people anyway, but, but if they're going to listen to people, they will listen to other farmers, ra ra rather than necessarily you know, people coming from outside. Um, and farmers they respect, and you've got to be really careful here too, because you know you might get, and there's one I can think of in my part of the world I won't mention, who you know is seen by other farmers as being a bit flaky. So you need to be careful who you choose in your ambassadors. You need to choose farmers who other farmers are going to respect and respond to. Um, but can we start um, creating sort of and people who are doing the right thing, encouraging them, maybe even, I don't know, a little bit of seed funding facilitation to be more ambassadors to proactively uh, go out and recruit others to do likewise. Um, to me, the, what would be great is if we can build up clusters of, of uh, sort of thing you were showing, Harry, on your slide in, in North Devon, I think, I think it was, of, of, of it's, it, we don't, it would be lovely, but we don't have to have every farmer in Devon or every farmer in the country doing the right thing. You need to have enough, and they need to be connected. And so if you can have a cluster of farmers in each 10 kilometer square in the country, that would be a hell of a good way forward. And, and so how can we make that happen? Um, I'm not sure, but uh, you know, that's something I think we should, we should, we should think about. Are there other things? Now, here I really am going to throw out some daft ideas. But I would be willing, as somebody who cares passionately about biodiversity, to give quite a lot to farmers who are willing to do the right thing. Now, it'd be lovely to chuck lots of money at them. I don't have lots of money. There isn't lots of public sector financing around. But what other things could we do that would be part of the deal? OK, you commit to doing the right thing for biodiversity. What can I give you? that would be really good value. I'll chuck out a few ideas and you can and you can tell me if you think this is crazy and maybe come up with better ideas yourselves. Um, and I hesitate to I just say this is personal job, don't quote me on this in that thing in the book. Planning. Planning. Could we say to the farmers, okay, you commit to this biodiversity contract or whatever it is, we'll give you an easier ride on planning. Somebody, some city, my host friend here, last night, said, ah, a stupid idea. They already can do whatever they want on planning. It's not quite that simple. Um, but, you know, and what, we, uh, what is my sense is that if, if, if farmers were able, for example, to, to get permission to put up a cottage or a house for their children, okay, maybe it's a bad idea. But is there something we can do to make planning easier for them as part of a deal? That in return for that, you would you would have to commit to, to, to the doing the right thing on biodiversity, um, whatever that means. And I can come back to that too. Are there other things? Are there um, are there are there are there tax breaks or even even a level playing field? One of the things that that, that I found out uh, not so long ago that surprised me that apparently the revenue or HMRC, if you are managing um, land for, if, if it's agricultural land, it's inheritance tax free. If you're managing land for conservation, that's not perceived by HMRC as being agriculture and therefore may not be eligible for inheritance tax free. I, I was told that, I don't know if that's true. And also in terms of things like capital allowances, I was told that if you, were, if you wanted kit for, for, for conservation, it's not given the same treatment as if it's kit for farming. But for agriculture, so you need to have a level playing field. Are there any tax breaks that we can give to people who do the right thing? Mr. Osborne would like that because it would cost the exchequer. Um, but um, but are there some things in that that sort of tax treatment area we can do? Is there? Can we create less bureaucracy? If you if you hear you know farms hate the bureaucracy, is there a way somehow we can create less bureaucracy if you're doing the right thing? I was glad somebody here is from South of Water, um, because one of the other hats that I wear, I'm, I'm also a non-exec on the board of Northumbrian Water. And as anybody in the water industry will know, um, that uh, Ofwat, our marvellous regulator, um, 
has a, a category of enhanced status for, for water companies. Um, it's, it's not totally clear how sort of big the benefits of that, of that are. But, but the idea of, of, of off what doing that is that if there are some companies that, that are seen as doing the right thing in off what's terms, they will be given less hassle, that they will be deemed low risk. They, they won't have quite the same severe annual audit as, 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 as other water companies will have. Um, now, it doesn't mean they won't be audited at all, but it's more a self-assessment <coughs> process. Is there something along those lines sort of, that we could do that would, that, would, that, would, that would encourage farmers to buy into this biodiversity contract? Um, I don't know. Is there market advantage? Um, <coughs> trademarks, kite marks, we have a red tractor. Could we have a green trailer on the red tractor? <laughs> are there, are there, are, is there something we can do that creates market advantage for farmers who do the right thing? Now again, many people say, oh no, for God's sake, don't go that, down that road. But we've got too many logos, we've got too many this, too many that. But somebody, actually I think it's you, Joe. You mentioned FSC. Um, in the timber trade, when I was at WRDF, we were very much involved in setting up the Forest Stewardship Council, which was all about encouraging timber producers to do the right thing from a sustainability point of view. And actually, it was a guy called Chris Knight, I don't know if any of who worked for B&Q, who he said, I will sign up to this thing and I will get B&Q to commit that we will only take timber with an FSC logo. And that had a fairly transformative effect. And now, I don't know what percentage of, of, of timber that, that has an FSC or some other certification to it, but it's quite hard. And it became quite difficult for timber producers to sell their stuff for the same price unless they had that certification there. We don't have that for, for, for food, really. Um, equally on fish, the Marine Stewardship Council with the MSC logo, um, again, it, it's not sort of a panacea for fisheries, but I would suggest that even those who aren't, I actually went into that dreaded place, Tesco, the other day, and, um, and went up to the fish counter and asked the person behind the counter, uh, does this fish come from a sustainable source? Oh, of course it does. I said, are you sure? Does it actually have a sort of, uh, oh, yeah, no, we do all that stuff. You know, we do all that stuff. <laughs> now, I mean, but, the, but it was interesting because actually he didn't know whether or not it had a, a, the certificate or not. But somebody had told him it's important that we tell the customer that our <laughs> comes from a sustainable source. And is there something on those lines that we can do in, in terms of food? Now my time is, is, is up, so I'm, I'm going I'm to stop in a sec. But you can see where I'm going. I'm trying to think of ideas that we can do that will, that will, will encourage more wildlife uh, friendly farming. And I did want to get across the message um, that from you know, Natural England's point of view, the money may not be there, and who knows what's going to happen after the spending review in, in the next couple of months. But we do want to be looking at how we do, can, can do things differently. And uh, somebody mentioned the outcomes approach, which you will hear from Natural England people. And, and the much more the matter is, what, what, what's important is delivering the environmental outcome. What is not important is ticking the boxes and how you get there. And we want to be much more flexible as to how you get there, as long as you get there. It doesn't mean that, that, um, that you can do whatever, whatever you want and not achieve the environmental outcome, but, but, but you want to be flexible as, as, to, as to how you can uh, do it. And um, so, there we go. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you very much for, for, for listening.